Google where he uh, culminated his time there as the program manager for a, a hiring veterans, the Google's uh, efforts to hire more veterans. And he recently became the uh, president and CEO of the DC Chamber of Commerce where he is charged with uh, trying to provide uh, network, networking opportunities, education opportunities, and the other um, support infrastructure for, uh, and, I, and I left out, he's actually started his own business and, and so is well familiar with the challenges of being an entrepreneur um, and of communicating the value of a new idea and the importance of a new idea to potential investors, et cetera. So um, again, he's, he's come at this challenge of communicating and being communicated to from multiple different perspectives um, and has graciously agreed to share his thoughts and observations on the topic with us. So Harry, thanks so much for taking the time to be here. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you, Maureen. I'd actually like to say thank you to uh, each of you uh, for what you do. Uh, it's, it's, I'm humbled by the opportunity uh, to come by CSIS and I've worked with CIS, uh, CSIS uh, in years past and talking technology. Uh, I know that's the theme and you're spending the day uh, looking at it. And I just wanted to share a couple of thoughts uh, from my perspective uh, from when I was a consumer of technology uh, in the sense of being a uh, junior officer uh, in the SEAL teams, which uh, you know, remains an honor. Um, I'll always be a frog man. And then going into industry and uh, you know, one aspect of that was spending a couple of years at Google, uh, which is just such a historic uh, company. And then their approach to technology how they apply it, but also communicate it, uh, about it. And then now I'm, I'm president and CEO of the DC Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we're about a three to $4 million uh, dollar operation. I've got uh, a little bit over a dozen people, and uh, we are the voice for business in the nation's capital. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not Tom Donahue. I, people give me a raise sometimes, and you know, he's, uh, he's doing great work. But uh, I am for the city, and if you're doing business in the city, uh, that's what I focus on. But going to uh, technology, uh, again, I know that we have uh, you know, several uh, different uh, classes of stakeholders here in the room. If I could see a show of hands, who here is uh, right now with uh, U.S. Uh, Defense or Department of Defense or IC? Well, Actually, you wouldn't raise your hand if you're IC. That's a straight trick question. <laughs> okay. Uh, who here is uh, with industry, private sector? Okay, great. Who here is with uh, academia or, okay, excellent. And how about international, someone who's non-U.S.? Excellent, great. Uh, so, I think for, for technology, one of the things to keep in mind, and I, I just have a strong imprint on this and just who I am and how I look at it, going to the Naval Academy, uh, ex scientia tridens is our, is one of, you know, is our motto, and out of, out of knowledge, sea power. And so one of the things that is in this conference is technology and how that, what, what that means for uh, defense. But I think what's powerful about the United States is that we have the approach that technology uh, matters for us because of the results that it gives in our national defense, but also in our prosperity. Uh, I am a capitalist, and I think that's one of the biggest things that we have going for us. And why is that? Uh, technology has to do, it only advances if you have a certain amount of liberty and freedom uh, to innovate. You know, we've got some military people here, so the OODA loop, and you hear about that. Uh, that's a common theme that I've seen over time. Uh, so special forces, you have the opportunity uh, to innovate and to apply and actually make a difference and you have that, that freedom uh, to make sure that you, yes, you have what you're given and uh, that's a different type of communication as well. I'll tell you what, I, I showed up, Spuds class 157 after graduating from Annapolis and uh, you can imagine how it feels to show up and, and uh, there's enlisted folks who run the, uh, the training there, right? So I showed up uh, as an officer and uh, you know, it's, it's just a, you can imagine, it's fun. There's a certain type of thing that technology is communicated to you there uh, because I would say that how you organize teams is an aspect of technology. How you organize and ha allow people to uh, contribute ideas, uh, how you look at uh, refining processes. And uh, on the international side of things, one special forces uh, leader I think about is David Sterling. Started the SAS, World War II. The idea was to go from these big units and his idea, he almost got kicked out of the uh, British Army, and he literally gave an one of the best elevator speeches in history. And uh, the SAS was born when he was given freedom uh, to harass the Germans uh, in the desert with just a bunch of, bunch of guys in, in cars that were disguised to look like uh, German vehicles. Then if you look at somebody like Eric Olson, my first assignment in the SEAL teams 
was working at Seal Delivery Vehicle uh, One. So I believe in sustainability, clean energy. I've talked about, I've been at a smart grid company during my career. I did some energy work at Google. But I like to tell people my first uh, job, I drove an electric vehicle years and years ago. Just happened to be underwater, <laughs> right? So um, from that aspect, what the special forces and, and the units out there, uh, you have technology being applied. But then, then you look at the uh, private sector, and there clearly uh, is an overlap. Uh, military can't do everything on its own. Uh, I think a great story that illustrates that, Marin and I were talking briefly about this, uh, there is the story about how uranium came into the United States uh, to have enough of the store that had those two, two bombs that you know, ended World War II. There's a Belgian businessman. Anybody know this story? Raise, raise your hands. OK, there's a book called Uranium. There, see one person back there. There's a great book called Uranium, the Rock that Changed the World. But as far as communication goes, who knew there was a Belgian uh, businessman who was reading science magazines and keeping up with what was going on with atomics. And uh, this was uh, as the Nazis were rising to power. He literally took it on himself to go down to the Congo, uh, Shinkwa Lobwe, I think is the name of the mine, where there was the largest store of uranium in the world. At his own expense, he shipped this to Staten Island. And here's the communication part. And here's something to keep in mind. I think when you go into your eight breakout sessions, I hope you talk about this sort of thing. He went to DOD, he went to, well, he went to the Army back in those days, uh, for the US and said, hey, uh, I, I got this stuff, and I didn't want the Germans to get a hold of it. And he basically got the, yeah, yeah, whatever, buddy, you know. <laughs> and then it turns out that the, uh, somebody asked about this. Someone remembered this person's name. He was put in touch. Uh, and we got the store of uranium that we needed. Uh, it was critical that we have that, that amount. Didn't go to the Nazis. We got it. And of course, in Staten Island, is, that site is still a disaster because he <laughs> stored it in the warehouse on his own, <laughs> private sector. Uh, true story. <laughs> So that's inspiring. Let me go back a little further back, because I love history. And I understand that there was a uh, uh, gentleman who talked about the Monitor earlier uh, today, right? And I, I love naval references, right? Go Navy. Um, I'll go further back than that, the Greeks. Uh, there is a great book by John Hale called Lords of the Sea. And it's about the Athenian Navy and the birth of democracy. And this is one of the best aspects of communicating technology that has ever happened. And it changed the course of history. There was a Greek uh, uh, warrior, seaman, and a uh, man named Themistocles, political leader. And what happened is in Attica, the Greeks found a store of silver just by what the Greeks would call fortuna, happenstance, luck. But luck, it matters what you do with it. Instead of taking that store of silver and doling it out for political favors, which is where things almost went, Themistocles staked everything he had on convincing uh, not just uh, the Athenians, but all the Greeks in league to build triremes, this new type of warship. Uh, three layers of, of levels of people rowing, and they had this bronze that they put on the front with a battering ram, and they knew the Persians were coming. Xerxes was on his way. And uh, he convinced them by communicating, this is exactly how uh, this is gonna make a, a difference for our survival. And communicating that science, what was important too is he put a little bit of money in it. I am president of the DC Chamber of Commerce. My tie is green, <laughs> right, because it's the color of money. But money really is about opportunity and growth. It's also green, by the way, for local folks, because uh, I support Muriel Bowser. She's going to be a great mayor. And if you ever want to get in the local scene in DC, uh, please join the DC Chamber if you're business. But what Themistocles did is he said, look, if you don't believe me about the Persians coming, these will also be good for just protecting our own shipping. So it had monetary value. He was able to communicate to the market, this is why it matters. And it was really one of the first public-private partnerships that ever happened. And what did happen is the, the, the uh, Persians came, they won, the Battle of Salamis, Straits of Salamis, uh, changed history, and then the Greeks went expeditionary with these vessels that they had. And they actually took the fight uh, to the enemy, and then their uh, adventures led to Egypt, other parts of the world, and an empire was born, and it changed things. Why I like that story and why it was so critical is the way they organized themselves. If you look at uh, the city, the, how democracy, their approach, uh, it really was about ordered liberty. It was about freedom, not only in war fighting, but freedom and, and just the very basics of society. So if we move forward to Google, and my observations there, here you have a, uh, a company that started out as a, as a science paper, right, with uh, Larry and Sergey and Backrub. I don't know if anybody's read the paper, it's actually up. And how do you look at uh, organizing 
all this information that's going to be out in this new thing called the web, which, by the way, I have to give a shout out to Vince Cerf, uh, who was a colleague of mine. He's a great American, being at DARPA, uh, he and Paul Kahn, uh, in 1974, working, and I know DARPA is well represented here, and we can't give enough to DARPA. Uh, we can't give enough to VHS, S&T, as long as they're applying it, of course, but they've done great work over, over time. And we know that, you know, Vent was working for national security uh, interests, and, you know, he's a great, great patriot, but he also believes in, in privacy and freedom and just, you know, just a great American. Larry and Sergey, communicating. You have to convince markets. You have to convince uh, investors. Here's why this matters. And to grow and actually to focus on delivering value uh, to the user is something that's critical. Uh, we do this. I know special forces uh, the user are your buddies uh, and, you know, the folks that depend on you actually threading the needle, needle being able to make uh, a, a, a result that's just many times order of magnitude bigger than it should be uh, for what you're doing. Likewise, if you've got a company and you're an entrepreneur and what's amazing about capitalism, why liberty wins is because you have that freedom to operate. You have that freedom to have creative destruction, uh, destruction for you know, the powers that be. Remember horse and buggy? And then you had the automobile. That fight, that continual renewal and growth uh, is there. But what matters is the struggle and having that freedom to communicate. And yes, how do you talk technology there? You have to talk it in a way that matters to, uh, to shareholders. But you also have to talk it to your users. What I was uh, really, I joined Google in 2008. I was in the DC office. I was a lobbyist for a large amount of time there. And uh, what I saw is that focus on the user and that focus on making things very easy to use, intuitive, but you also have to communicate and continually show people this is why this is a better product. And then also the idea of just continuing to find out what does the user want and being willing to drop some projects and go on to others. Um, that's, that's critical. If I look at the city level, oh, and one thing at Google too that I learned, I know policy is the order of the day here in DC, whether it's local, which I'm very focused on, the Wilson building with the, uh, the mayor and the council, but we have the Congress. And we know we just had a lot of upheaval. I think that's, it's important. Uh, democracy thrives on that. I have personal feelings about gerrymandering and how we do those sorts of things. If to the extent that it may structure, uh, you know, what the founders intended, uh, we can come back to that. But I think what's important is that we're able to uh, change and renew and listen to what people want and technology in that sense uh, continues to be important. Congress has things at one level, then it gets down to the agencies. While I was at Google, I was able to make a point about uh, smart grid. $4.5 billion in the stimulus package went to smart grid pilots. So smart grid is really just an instance of IoT, Internet of Things, where you've got the electric grid. Utility company doesn't even know these lights are on. Uh, as we move forward, and this is trillions of dollars over years, we'll start to upgrade the grid. Pepco. Uh, being acquired by Exelon. They're putting a, a $1 billion undergrounding project in. There are elements of smart grid in that. While I was at Google, I was lucky enough to, after talking to Vent Cerf, uh, just had an idea on a weekend, I did. And uh, I said, Vent, you know, $4.5 billion is gonna go to what really is an energy internet. It should be for open protocol. Because open protocol approaches, I mean, not, not just proprietary. And Congress should say, uh, this is, you know, that we're only gonna give these dollars if open protocol is available. Um, and if it's appropriate, of course. We went for it, uh, now Senator Markey uh, took it up, he championed it. Uh, what I heard back is that by the time it got to uh, Nancy Pelosi uh, on the House side, it was pretty straightforward, and this is communicating technology. Something that had completely very technical, complicated arguments, things about cybersecurity, security through obscurity, which we had to like uh, address those arguments. But at member level, communicating technology, or talking technology, it had turned into, look at what the internet had done. Vent Cerf could speak very powerfully on that issue. And for the house at least, it said, this is an energy internet. We should allow this to be open protocol. The OODA loop, the innovation cycle will happen more and it will translate into jobs and a better approach. Uh, we had to work harder on the Senate side uh, because there were vested interests for companies. <laughs> As you can imagine, if you have millions of dollars at stake on proprietary systems, you're gonna have another approach to talking technology. Uh, what I was really just, uh, I can't believe this happens, I pinch myself to think, it went through and one of the biggest opponents now talks technology in a different way. They hired an open protocol specialist. Now if you look at smart grid and, and the ways it's talked about, you can see that it was embraced and it's actually being implemented at DOE and, uh, and other programs. City level. Uh, so for Washington DC, 
Uh, one of the reasons I am just so excited about being in this job is we have hard work to do, not only on sustaining the great energy and in, uh, international investment that's going on in the city, but not forgetting that uh, we have a part of the city, east of the river, if you will, east end, wards seven and eight if you want to get really local, where our graduation rates may not be, they're not where we need them to be. Uh, and my strong feeling is, as we look into what's really critical now, cyber, uh, I like to say the code is mightier than the sword. Uh, we have had uh, African Americans. I'm African American, I was born in the city. Uh, my parents moved from southeast when I was five years old. I would have grown up in a pretty rough neighborhood. We kept going to church in DC even though I moved uh, out to Maryland. My wife is from Chevy Chase, DC. Uh, I joked with her, said I never went over there until I was out of, out of uh, college. But here's the point about te talking technology. Uh, as Americans, uh, until we can get the academic results up, until we can communicate why it matters to be uh, not, not just into STEM and technology, coding is a new way of communicating. I think it's a new literacy, and we really have to take it seriously. Because as you know in this room, there are a lot of ways that we need people to pick up a computer, not just a rifle, and to make a difference in what we collectively are trying to do uh, as the United States and with our allies, and just as, at a minimum level for making sure that, that commerce and, and just what civilized nations do it has a floor. <laughs> and so uh, you can see my point uh, about why we, we really have to get into that, but how do we talk technology in that sense? And so at the level of government, at the level of politicians, um, I commend each of you for what you try to do to maintain money for programs. I heard a comment about, well, if we've got 10,000 programs out there, how do we keep them going? And then one final thought, because I, I, I know I have to close, so I'm a big believer in training the way you fight. And uh, Navy SEALs, we live in a, uh, a shame society, not a guilt society. <laughs> Things are open. You're only as good as your next fight. And so to the extent that you have programs where you can demonstrate, uh, when you can really test, and I, I guess I'm, it's beyond simulations, it's actually saying how do we apply this uh, in a very realistic scenario. In cyber, I really like the idea of having uh, you know, constant scrimmages, if you will. Uh, I went to the Naval Academy. I think as a starter, you could have the Naval Academy, Air Force, West Point, put up not just the cyber defense exercises, which are phenomenal. I know there are some uh, folks who have done that for about nine years. We take some of the best from the academies and they have cyber challenges and go against each other for uh, th you know, three days. Fantastic. But when I was a plebe, we stood watch in the kinetic sense. Walked around you know, our portion of the academy and challenge anybody, tackle them if you had to, <laughs> you know, if they're, they're not supposed to be there. Why not put a VMware instance, you put on a machine at each of those watch stations, coordinate it with the battalion level up to, you know, the, the, the regiment, the brigade, which, the, whatever at the academy, and just make it a real exercise where you're getting hit every week at least, maybe every day. And at the end of the year, you could give the commander, you know, the commander's cup for cyber for the best uh, academy that did that. You could also pull in schools like uh, George Washington, which in the city here is doing phenomenal things. Uh, Maryland's doing great things. Johns Hopkins, uh, because of APL and their, you know, what's going on at John, at there. But those sorts of things where you look at it, then you can actually start building on top of that other results. And what I'm getting to is if you have the right type of test bed where things are being communicated, uh, you can actually have results surface in a way that matters to leaders who are up higher, who can see results and you can point to it. Uh, numbers are the, you know, are the language of business. Uh, they are also the language of making decisions for politics, not always, but a lot of times. And so I think throughout history for me, I just wanted to share that special forces approach. Uh, I, I've been you know, just very humbled to work with. Uh, so many people have done amazing things. I saw uh, Admiral McRaven uh, in a bookstore here in town a couple days ago. Uh, just, uh, just a very um, soft-spoken and powerful and just, a, a, a just impactful leader. And uh, just to think about how he speaks from experience, the difference that he made. But really, I guess if I want to wrap up with one thought, and I, I don't know if we have time for questions or not, yeah, but yeah, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Uh, how would I tie ordered liberty to uh, you know, talking about technology? I really think it's into having the freedom uh, to innovate, uh, to make a difference, and actually demonstrate uh, that what you're doing matters for defense. Uh, we, we can never tamp down on that. Unfortunately, uh, we know how bureaucracies go. <laughs> we know that 
uh, things get strangled off sometimes that, that, that shouldn't. But again, what each of you do in trying to talk technology uh, is absolutely uh, critical. And there's different types of conversations, yes, going on within the government, different conversations going on in the private sector, different conversations that are going on politically. Uh, what I'm excited about is I think Washington, D.C. is a unique environment in which we can uh, you know, try and pull all those things together, whether it's with our phenomenal health care, uh, the hospitals that are here, doing tech transfers with a dozen plus universities that are here in town. Uh, drones, wow, if, Maryland, if Virginia has, and Maryland have one of the six pilots that are allowed, I know there's concerns about national airspace, but what if we did some limited pilots here where we could del deliver a defibrillator by drone or an EpiPen? Or, uh, God forbid, there was a you know, homeland type uh, response and tourniquets. We know from Boston, uh, sometimes you need to augment how many of those are, are needed. Somebody had a heart attack, you get your phone out, hit it, and it, it comes over here and lands uh, sooner than you could find the one that's somewhere else. Those types of things, um, you know, maybe that's not the best example, maybe um, immunological responses, uh, how I could model cell phones if people want to participate, the likelihood that we're going to transmit something and on a phone, and it's a city. Cities matter. Uh, you know, the volume that we have, the minds that we have in this town, it's a great place to talk technology. And uh, with that, I just want to thank each of you for what you're doing. I'm humbled by the opportunity to speak, and uh, thank you very much. It's a tour de force of <laughs> grease to happy pen by drone, but uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, questions for Harry? Yes, yes oh, sir. We got a whole, a whole slew over there. If I could ask a favor, if you could just say your name and where you're from, uh, I'd appreciate it. Hi, Jerry Epstein with the Department of Homeland Security. Yes, sir. You've emphasized the importance of talking technology or a theme and adding value and making clear the value that's added. One of the struggles that the technical community has had ever since the Government Performance and Results Act from the 90s is how do you do that in the basic research arena? You can make general arguments which we know are true. You don't know when it's going to pay off, it's going to have massive breakthroughs, but you really can't structure it and it's it's very difficult to find a metric. One of my concerns is it seems like we keep taking money away from things that are useful and dumping it into things that are measurable. And so I'm wondering how you address the basic research part of this communications and how you make clear the value you're adding with anything less, anything more specific than a very general argument. Uh, that's a great question, Jerry. And I think one thing is just to remember, uh, and this is part of the mandate of DARPA, you need teams that just think of something. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, if, it, if it works, it's not crazy, but you have to have uh, and accounting for uh, just taking, you know, just being expeditionary in, in different types of things that may work, and you look at the payoff and what it might be, we have to really call out examples in history where it could have been something that somebody had thought that, that that's just crazy. Like, wh why would you do that? And then point to the case that, well, this actually turned out to be not so crazy, and it's not crazy if it, you know, if, if it works. So I think that that is a challenge. Uh, but I think one of the main things that you can do is take the bigger picture, you know, across time and look at examples of uh, things that, well, for example, I, I, I love uh, what we did with, uh, you know, the, the British, frankly, uh, during World War II. And if you look at someone like Alan Turing and, you know, the Colossus, uh, if people hear about Enigma, but Colossus and all those efforts would have sounded insane to somebody. But somebody has to have that, that conversation to remember over, over time there have been so many examples of that, and we just have to account for it. Uh, I don't say just trust, uh, and, and I hope that's, that's a general answer, but I think it's something that we really have to uh, continually remind policymakers uh, why that's the case. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Hey, can, I have to, can I follow up on that? Um, one of our earlier speakers alluded to something. He had just seen something about the iPhone and, and all the, and a deconstruction of all the various uh, Defense Department investments that had been incorporated into the iPhone. So to sort of get at Jerry's question, do you think those kinds of reverse engineering, ultimately you know, tangible applications of basic research advances, whether it be for the iPhone or any, any, anything else that people can relate to intuitively more than perhaps basic research, are impactful or um, are they, are, are, is it sort of preaching to the choir? I think it's, um, I think it remains impactful and for basic research, uh, again, the question is how do we talk about it in a way that shows this is what's happened in the past and, and this is tricky, it's not easy to really translate it. One thing, I, I, muscle research, 
uh, won't go into it here, but I think it's really critical. Skeletal, skeletal muscle, some things that are happening, and it's not, it's open source about how uh, you might have some of what we learn about that can, could apply for actuators, for robotics, uh, right? So I see some nods. Um, we didn't understand how muscles worked until 1954, right? It's on a, on a deep level. A lot of that had to do with advances where someone might have, you may not have predicted, uh, you know, how you could look at microscopes and, you know, uh, electron scanning microscopes and how that would open up a whole other area. But again, it goes to communicating how basic scientific research, uh, you know, really can make a difference and we have to keep at it. And again, we have to have uh, freedom uh, for folks to go off and explore uh, in, in areas. And, you know, it's not limitless. We do have uh, funds, uh, you know, and, and limitations. Uh, but I think, you know, we do have a structure from past uh, performance and past wins. And, you know, there are things that, you know, should never be talked about, but those teams actually, you know, have also track records. And we just have to keep at it all the time, you know, to, to argue this is why uh, it's important. That's why I'm a really huge fan of red teaming. Really huge fan of, uh, I, th I think, to the extent that there are barriers to, and I'll just say it straight, it's, it may not be politic, to embarrassing some programs. Just to say, I mean, somebody has to say, the emperor has no clothes on, and I think uh, those elements within basic research, within you know the science of what we're what we're going after, that's critical too. Um, but you have to prove it. I really on basic research, going back to uh, just keeping you know people aware that when we talk technology, we have to tie it to past successes and keep pushing the envelope on how much we're willing to um, you know sh show what the payoff could be if, if you get things right. Uh, and I'll tell you some wild science. Like my, I have three daughters. I talk about STEM all the time. Uh, my oldest daughter, uh, talk about you know the, the, a dad who's lucky. She goes, uh, Dad, I'm not really thinking about organic chemistry as much now. It's just straight math. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but we had this conversation about the Higgs boson. So you know that happened, and you know the God particle and all that. And uh, dark energy sounds exotic. Sounds crazy, right? Um, bet we better be at that, <laughs> even if it doesn't seem like it's going to pay off anytime soon. Uh, my story about that Belgian gentleman uh, who went out in atomics sounded so exotic and crazy uh, at one point. And then, you know, shocking the world uh, with those two first atomic weapons. Uh, it's basic research matters, but I think we just can't say enough the difference that those, uh, we don't want to be surprised. And that's why, you know, God bless DARPA to make sure that we avoid strategic surprise. That's, that's really critical. Sir. Thank you, Nate Hughes, uh, Second Front Systems. Um, as both someone who's at the tip of the spear and also at Google, um, I'd be very interested in your perspective on where we find ourselves um, in the national security space with technology. And so, to be specific, um, more and more innovation is happening out west in Silicon Valley and elsewhere that is really beyond any influence by government. It's, it's by industry, it's, it's entrepreneurial to solve problems locally. Um, and add on to that our, uh, our friend Edward, who's currently residing in Moscow. Um, it's become, I think, less compelling um, for many people um, in many important demographics to do work with the government, particularly with the intelligence community and with DOD. Um, how do we walk that back? How do we talk about technology in terms of the ways we use it in the national security intelligence space um, to make the work, the, the important innovations that's happening out west um, applicable, accessible? Um, you know, some of these companies don't even want to sell to the government if the government wants to buy their technology. Um, how, do we, how do we think about that? How do we talk about that? So, it, um, I'm sorry, your first name is it Dean? Nathan, I'm sorry, got that way off. Nathan, um, it's a great question. And in fact, that's on my mind here for Washington, D.C. Uh, because one of the things that we talk about here in the city is how can we diversify? Uh, we know we've, in some ways, we've been a company town on, on uh, some of the uh, technological uh, business that goes on here. Uh, our version of Crystal City, uh, I'm sorry, our version of Crystal City, yes, is M Street, you know, between National Stadium and the Navy Yard. A lot of great work has happened there. There's contractors there. I want to see that expand. Uh, St. Elizabeth's got 150 acres, we've got where the old Walter Reed was, up George Avenue, uh, but how do we make it cool to work with the government? And that question of, wow, you think we've, we've done, we do amazing things not just in D.C., but in Virginia and, and Maryland close by. Um, 
we do have to diversify. Uh, but the question is, if, yes, and you mentioned in Snowden and concerns about privacy. First off, uh, that was, it was very harmful, uh, what he did. <laughs> you know, I just think it, uh, um, not a fan. And, uh, but I think that as far as the next generation and, and you know, young people, how do we uh, just really underscore that we are uh, an important force in the world? Uh, because you know, there are things that we uh, have to be at that go to government issues, that go to national security, uh, that we have to keep moving forward on. But the trick is, how do we bring some of that magic? You're right, from uh, Silicon Valley out here. I think some of it is here, but I think we have to just look at basic things. It may not sound sexy, uh, but things, but how, um, you know, how much does it cost to, you know, to really open up a uh, shop uh, in DC? I think of Ward 5 and New York Avenue, you ever driven you know, down you know, 50 and you look at all the buildings and warehouses and you're like, wow, it's kind of lying fallow. How do we, how do we open that up uh, sooner? Uh, so you know, the policies that really make it easier for folks to come in, I think our universities are critical too uh, because uh, the magic, Silicon Valley, we shouldn't forget the story that's there. There has been government impact, there's been government activity, uh, there still is uh, there. And I think the magic of Stanford and you know, growing off of, it's what you do with it and it's the ecosystem that you can spin off. I think we have that uh, tenfold here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we have amazing uh, research and programs that are going on at schools all over, all over the city. Uh, Gallaudet, for example, a $7 million project, NSF. I've talked to a, a PhD there where she's, she's got a cap that's actually reading, it's a neuroscience you know, type move, compelling. Somebody who even wouldn't think of any defense applications might be inspired to work on that program and uh, the research that you know, moves things forward, maybe that goes to, who here has heard of Talos? Raise your hand, okay, there you go. So exoskeletons <laughs> for uh, the Navy SEALs, there you go. It could be something where uh, the program where the, you know, the, the, the skull cap at, at uh, Gallaudet was to help uh, deaf children or cochlear damage to learn, you know, uh, kids who can see and hear, they learn about language in a different way. Who would know that that program might actually have applications that could uh, you know, make a difference for an exoskeleton and control units if you're basically putting on a robot? Uh, that's, that's kind of a long-winded answer, but I, I guess what I go back to is we can do it here. We need to ask questions. Uh, we've had other successes. If you look at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, if you look at what Boston's been able to do and they've been doing robotics, I really think Washington, D.C., we have an opportunity, and just more generally, uh, to remember that there's an application for what happens. Cloud computing is a great example. I think cloud computing and, uh, and look at Chromebooks, it costs $180 and you've got a computer that's one of the first hardware enforced security approaches uh, you know, that's out there. If you haven't seen those, uh, that people are still learning about Chromebooks with Google, uh, there's some really good science and cryptography that's, you know, that's involved there and I think they don't have to be uh, mutually exclusive, you know, working on defense and working on uh, you know, things that you know, hipsters or you know, kids are like, I would never go to, to DOD or work for uh, the government. I think it just, uh, we just have to keep at it. That's a different way to talk about technology and inspiring people to you know, work on, on projects that could, you know, could help the government. I realize maybe I was thinking, I saw all the hands over there because that's the way I was facing. <laughs> Questions over on this side? I also wanted to thank J.D. McCreary. <laughs> who, uh, you know, just um, it's instrumental in me being here, too. Can I ask questions? No, you just kidding. <laughs> here, we'll go back there. Hi, Ar Arun Serafin, Center Armed Services Committee. Um, I'm sorry if I missed this earlier on in your presentation, but um, in addition to the universities in town, you have three or four fantastic federal research institutions with lots of scientists producing lots of technologies. And so yes. what kind of relationship is being developed with the Naval Research Lab Army Research Lab, NIST, the other folks in town are actually doing science for a living, not just funding science for a living. That, that's, a, that's a great, great question. Uh, I need your help on those relationships. Uh, I have some you know, past connections from uh, you know, what, I've, what I've done over time, uh, but I absolutely would invite each of you uh, to, to look at me as, as someone who wants to help in what we're doing. Uh, I, I mentioned for a purpose uh, that example of Athens, you know, a great city state. Uh, that worked on technology, uh, both on the commercial sense, the civic sense, and frankly the military sense. We have that here in Washington, D.C. So those connections I would 
you know, I have some, but I would like to uh, make them stronger. On NIST, uh, the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence is in Shady Grove. It's a, it's a little, you know, a bit further away. Nate Lesser, um, you know, who's uh, the director over there, and I know Senator Mikulski has given money directly, you know, to that program. Uh, but absolutely, uh, I want to find ways to, um, you know, make sure that we're applying the resources as one of the greatest cities, uh, in, you know, in the world uh, to the efforts that are there. And all the better if we're able to talk to a certain venture capitalist, for example, and say this particular uh, company, which is deciding to open up shop, uh, I think of Enlightened Inc. as an example. My past chair uh, from, you know, for the DC Chamber of Commerce, Antoine Ford, born in DC, African American. He has 162 people at an IT shop. Uh, they handle all the police records for the city. Uh, they do some of the healthcare uh, issues. Uh, they have cleared folks, uh, including Naval Academy grads. They hire a lot of veterans. They have some IC uh, alumnus, uh, alumni there. So, I mean, that's an example of just one, one company. But I really want us to uh, work together, and that's why I'm really thankful uh, you know, that I could come uh, speak to you, because really this is an invitation. Uh, someone who, you know, I, I see the benefit. It's a, big, it's a big, big part of why I took this job as well. Uh, I was growing a cyber company. Uh, you know, before I, I just was contacted by a recruiter for this, and I'm from D.C., and I saw the potential to, you know, really leverage those types of relationships for right, that are right here, and we can make a difference not only for uh, companies that, you know, just want to thrive, I'm all for that, but we can make a difference for everybody who's in the city. Thanks. Do you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, what is one of the main, or uh, how important are um, our patents to venture capitalists? I would say they're important. <laughs> I would, uh, but how I would, important? I would say, you know, I'm not a venture capitalist myself, okay. uh, but as far as, and nor am I a patent attorney. Uh, I do know, actually, a classmate of mine, Max Grant. If you don't know Max Grant, he's one of the best patent attorneys uh, in the country. Navy SEAL officer, uh, Naval Academy. But I would say, you know, from my time at Google, having been a lawyer, uh, and I'd like to hear your, your, your perspective if you want to mention a little bit more, I think it's critical because of, you know, what it means for certainty, prediction of how, you know, where a company's going to go, um, and also it demonstrates something, too, that you've been able to put a patent out. But what's your uh, position? Well, uh, my name's Tom Payne. I'm a West Point graduate. Yes, sir. And a uh, Army Ranger, former, not yeah. now. <laughs> And um, I'm also was uh, one of the uh, chief patent counsels of uh, one of GE's major businesses. Yes. And in a two, two reports away from Jack Welch. And I'm just wondering on uh, the case of uh, Google, which you used to represent before the Congress. Yes, sir. Um, what is Google's position on patents? I, I wouldn't be uh, in the right place to, to represent them. Uh, at this point on wh where they are on the patents. But how do you feel, where do you think they should be on patents? I would say that Google is anti-patent at best. I'm sorry? Google is anti-patent at best. And uh, our economy, if they keep that up, will drop tremendously. Because those venture capitalists you were talking about yes, are not going to put money into basic research unless those people can obtain protection for it. Right now, the way that the Supreme Court and the Patent Office are acting is software patents are not patentable, period. And uh, you know who the leader of that was. Mr. Payne, I thank you for your comments and for your service as well. And uh, I thank you for your service. Yes, sir. We both, we both uh, stood in uh, barracks on guard. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. But what I would say about patents and, and spinning around to what I am, you know, my, my position now is uh, this goes back to universities and uh, we really have to find a way to push on, you know, we, we have so many great uh, universities in town and, uh, you know, I think of Jack DeGoya at Georgetown and Steve Knapp at, at, at GW uh, and Neil over at American. Looking at when they bring uh, professors in, thinking ahead, and this is something that Stanford's done a great job on. What are you working on? How can this translate into patents, right? And what's the track record in, tra in, in those translating into patents, but also uh, where are the spinoffs? Where are companies that then you, know, you go off and you stay in Washington, D.C.? I would love to see that, but thank you for your questions.
If I could ask a quick question about, um, as you try to help DC businesses succeed, presumably some of them are marketing to the government, some of them are looking at other uh, customers, do you uh, have, do you find yourself in a position of trying to help them have that communication effectively? And if so, uh, what kinds of guidance do you give them on um, how they think about those different audiences and, and how to talk to them? Yes, that's a great question. So we're, we're just getting started. Uh, I started in April. Uh, so my predecessor was uh, leaving the DC Chamber for 12 years and uh, Barbara Lang, uh, Captain Miller. And the DC Chamber actually 75 years old. So, but to the question of going and, and representing uh, companies and going in front of, of government and how to best uh, you know, represent themselves, uh, we have not, uh, I'll be honest, we haven't mm -hmm. gotten to that point yet. Some of what I, I'm at the point right now of working with the Small Business Administration, for example, mm -hmm. the regional director, Antonio Doss, uh, and I've been in touch with Javier Sade, if you look at tech transfer, right, and SIBR, those aspects, uh, are definitely in touch. We wanna try and bring that into the DC Chamber, mm -hmm. but as far as federal resources, and this is where I need your help as well. Um, I know Dr. Reggie Brothers, I'm a huge fan for DHS S&T, so he's here in town, uh, but having started in April, I'm just getting to the point where you know we're able to you know really uh, turn that into something where that's, that's programmatic. But the Small Business Administration is coming by the DC Chamber, and I love this. We're across from the Spy Museum, <laughs> but we're right by Gallery Place Metro, and uh, uh, so we have the SBA coming in every Thursday, and they're doing consultations out of the DC Chamber. I would love to have you know people from. Uh, NRL or other you know, outfits that you represent, uh, stop by, find a way that I can be a helpful, find a way that I can put people like uh, Enlightened Inc. and other folks, who, and I've had veterans join. Uh, people were connected with 1776, other tech places, and there are veterans uh, who have joined the DC Chamber since I've been there, but I, I think, uh, and that's just a, a straight answer, uh, we are going in that direction, it's on my mind, but I need your help uh, you know, with it. And my, my website is, um, you know, it's just www.dcchamber.org. Uh, and uh, so I'm right there. And, and as far as my name, I'd like to give you a mnemonic. So Harry, it's not, not descriptive, right? <laughs> and Wingo, W-I-N-G-O, when I was a plebe, I had somebody, I, I, I went to the Naval Academy just wanting to be a Marine and fly jets off carriers. And when I first saw pictures of Navy SEALs, I said, what are those, hippie Marines? And, uh, <laughs> but I, uh, Wingo is my last name. And so Harry Wingo, and uh, my team guy friends tease me because it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's terrible what my uh, internet, yeah, you're laughing, JD. My internet profile is horrible, right? I'm just like, I'm, I'm useless now. <laughs> but you guys, I'd like to really work on that very issue with, uh, you know, our companies. Question over here. Uh, James saying, well, that's a question about talking technologies and the care and feeding of technology. You mentioned the president of Georgetown, and the last time I heard him give a talk, he was uh, ruefully commenting about the number of people who asked him why Georgetown isn't Stanford. Um, <laughs> New York, which is in a pretty good situation as far as uh, science and technology schools, is building a big new monster campus. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could uh, reflect about how Washington can stay competitive. We have good schools, but we really don't have world-class Stanford, MIT, Caltech, type institutions, and do you think we really would benefit from having something like that? And if, I happen to say we do, and if we do, what we should do, what the community can do to try to create such an institution? Yeah, that's- meant except for the Naval Academy. Except that for the Naval you. Academy, and I actually, I think our, I do think our schools are world class, <laughs> and they're, they're members, but I think as far as getting world class in the sense of tech transfer, and you're, you're right, it's a Bloomberg, right, the effort with Technion, but so is Israel's version of MIT, Roosevelt Island, $100 million. Uh, that is a very specific thing that, that I would like to work on. I think one difference that we have is we, do, we probably need bigger uh, amounts of, of, of seed money you know, that we can actually apply uh, that go. And so I'd love to talk to you about that, anyone else who has strong, strong ideas on it. But I, I do think uh, we are poised to have phenomenal growth in that area. Uh, we have that opportunity. So I, I'd love to connect on, on your, you know, and get some more details about uh, how, you would, how, you know, how we can go about that together. Last question here. I'm Gotham Venigo Pollan at the State Department. Yes. And so we've talked a lot about how to talk about technology today, but 
maybe we can talk a little bit about using technology to talk, mm -hmm. particularly about local society issues. And is there anything that you guys are doing in your office about open data that might be used to help with civic engagement and things like that? Yes, that's a great question. Um, I think so. I, I'd like to work on my website. <laughs> I'm just getting, again, I'm a, a baby CEO in some ways because I just got started in April, a lot of ways. Uh, but communication is, is critically important. And uh, I think internationally, uh, I'd like to get you, bless you, to get your, uh, your uh, thoughts on this because already, even though I've been there for a couple months, I've met with probably three or four uh, Chinese delegations, as an example. Uh, 30 people at one time, uh, you know, from Beijing. And, you know, there's uh, just so many people who want to invest in Washington, D.C. And so the question of how we use technology to communicate, one, that we're open for business and how, uh, on a local level, you know, on a way to, you know, you know to invest and, and put our businesses, small, medium, large, because Kaiser Permanente, Care First, uh, Pepco, uh, Verizon, Microsoft, they're, they're supporters of the D.C. Uh, chamber. Um, Telemundo, you know, just, just joined. But I think uh, technology, uh, we, we face this, you know, all chambers, uh, you know, face this issue. Uh, we, we, we have limited staff, and so I think that's why having alliances, relying on our members as well uh, to get the word out, uh, it, you know, is important. On communication, we only, uh, not only is there the effort, and I, tw I, I, I tweet all the time. I'd invite you, if you guys want to see social media, <laughs> and uh, JD, you'll get a kick out of this. I just, you know, but I'm going from, you would, you, if you caught me, uh, you know, either locking out a submarine or, you know, doing counter drug work for a couple of years and told me that I would plan, I have a, I have a member here <laughs> from the DC Chamber that I was going to uh, put together a gala uh, where we sold over a thousand seats and had a Grammy Award winner, Jody Watley, you know, who was entertainment and I had to go through, you know, flower design and things that we we're going to have on drapes in the background and, <laughs> and we got two cars in, in, down at the Marriott Marquis and it's just part of it. It's just part of what goes on my toolkit now. But really, it comes down to communication. And, uh, and, but I think on the State Department side, too, and this is an important note about talking technology. Let me shift it a bit, and this may be encompass what you meant. Uh, prosperity is a message that we have you know, for the world. If you look at what's going on in Syria, in, in Syria and ISIS, and you know, just extremism is one example, uh, I still believe with all my heart that what we represent as a society you know, with liberty uh, with a chance, um, you know, for us to to just spread the message of prosperity, and that's linked to technology so you know so closely. Uh, I think that's something that chambers of commerce and cities uh, can help with. But we do need to hear from you. Okay, um, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us. We appreciate it. I think hopefully, all of you will be joining the DC Chamber of Commerce <laughs> this afternoon on your way out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, really appreciate you uh, offering your perspective on all of this. We've had a, since we had a little bit of attrition, which was somewhat expected, um, we have, we are now down to five groups. So, for those of you who on your name tag say that you are in groups six through eight, you're not. You are now, uh, group, group one and group eight will become group four. I'm kidding, so we're not going to average them. Um, <laughs> You, you will still be groups one and eight, but you will uh, meet right over here and, and uh, be on this side of the room. Groups two and group seven will be down at that side of the room. Um, groups three and four will both be going downstairs, which you can go down uh, either by the stairway or uh, on the elevators over there. And then groups five and six, if you could meet over by the elevators, you will be going up. So again, Harry, thanks immensely for taking the time to come talk with us. Thank and uh, we look forward to our conversations in our groups. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it.